And this, it's called collective restoration. The Swedes have just been studying it. This also contributes to well-being because there's no question that whilst you're on holiday, you should just check that email or just call in with a colleague because everyone's off. And you know that you're going to be able to hang out with your friends and family because they're going to be on holiday as well. And by the time everyone goes back to work in August, I mean, literally the whole of Denmark is shut down. There's nobody around. By the time everyone goes back in August, everyone is rested and rejuvenated and ready to, you know, face the next challenge. And if Danes need a little pick-me-up break after that, they have this amazing thing which you may have experienced called hugger. But it's, it's, it defies literal translation, but this is the best explanation I've seen. A complete absence of anything annoying or emotionally overwhelming, taking pleasure from the presence of gentle, soothing things. What that doesn't explain is that there's usually cake involved or coffee and candlelight. Um, Danes burn the most candles in the whole of Europe. So this hugger is, is really about spending time with friends and family and just pressing pause on daily life for a moment. And it's something that all Danes do all the time. It really just helps unite people. It's very much linked to the weather in Denmark. Um, in the bone-chilling uh, winter months, you get hugger inside with candles and coffee. In summer, you might have an ice cream on a park bench and just have a little moment to yourself. It's, it's a real culture of indulgence in a way that we don't really do in the UK unless we're about to guilt trip ourselves about it. So I found the hugger thing incredibly useful when I first moved there in bleak midwinter. Because at a time in the UK when everyone else is manically dieting or starting a new exercise regime and it's no fun at all come January. Danes, Danes don't go in for that. They don't do enforced deprivation. They're, they're kind to themselves and they're gentle to each other and, and that makes you a nicer person. So, you know, as one Danish friend put it, Hugger helps us to be nice to each other. And I could really see that after just a few weeks in Denmark. It became very clear that this was important and this sort of this culture of not depriving yourself means that you're not going to yo-yo, you're not going to swing and eat all the buns and then eat none of the buns. Just a bun a day, fine, fine, no problem. So the next thing I learned about what really helps Danes to be happy is trust. Whereas in Denmark, kids are encouraged to trust, they're encouraged to think that people are essentially good and the world is probably a, a decent place. And this trust is is rewarded, really, because Denmark is the least corrupt country in the EU. Politicians are even trusted in Denmark, can you imagine? So, notoriously untrusted in every other society ever. Politicians are thought of as normal people in Denmark, like in Borgen. They're really approachable, they're reasonable for the most part, and people don't people trust them. So they're paying these 50% plus taxes, which we'll get onto later, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> They're paying these taxes because they trust that the government will spend their money wisely and they trust that their fellow Danes will also contribute. Uh, so everybody's paying their fair share and, and, and it kind of works like that. Halfway through our year of living Danishly, I found out that finally I was expecting a baby. Um, it was not triplets, do not worry. <laughs> But at the start of 2012, I, uh, 2014, sorry, I gave birth to a baby boy and it was this experience that really won me round to the advantages of living Danishly. My husband took, took two weeks off post-birth and then uh, went back to work, tied up a few loose ends, building Lego, whatever it is he does. Um, and then he took 10 weeks off, his big shiny job. He took 10 weeks off, fully paid, to stay home and take care of his baby whilst I wrote this book because... It's recognised in Denmark that a man bonding with his child and understanding how, how this works, this parenting malarkey, is helpful. And as a result, he learned to bond with his son far sooner than, than friends I knew in the UK, where the guys were only able to spend time with their children at the weekends because they were home past their bedtimes during the week. So it, it really sort of underlined to me what a different way of looking at it is. Having done the whole parenting thing in Denmark, I am slightly terrified about what it would be like to do it here because it's tough enough as it is without be, being on your own. So for me, that was something that was really helpful. And in Denmark, it really feels as though that um, caregiving is valued as highly as breadwinning. The fact that paternity leave is, is just a done thing there um, and that the parental leave is shared. Caregiving is just as important as breadwinning and it doesn't matter who's doing what. Both, both types of work are necessary. Whether you have kids or whether you don't have kids, 
the whole world needs to carry on, and both of these things need to be valued. So in Denmark, it really felt, um, from the experience of having a child there, that there's not such a definition between women's work and men's work. It's just work. Both brilliant, and they're both important. Um, and it seems like Danes are just getting that a bit better than perhaps the rest of us are. Showed us strong women are valued in Denmark. No questions asked. You know, even from the, the mere physicality aspect, so women are not expected to ping back into shape after having a baby in Denmark. The Viking woman is, is strong and healthy rather than skinny. And, and as these TV shows that really made it big around the world showed, they were female protagonists who were strong and successful and ambitious and over 40. I mean, you just don't get that everywhere, really. There's not that same pressure to look 19 forever in Denmark for women. Um, the worldwide plastic surgery statistics came out the other week, and they show the 25 countries where the most procedures are made, and Denmark's never even made the list. So women get a pretty good deal in Denmark. Girls are, are taught that they can do whatever they like, they can do anything that a boy can do. They don't mind only having the choice between 50, between 10 brands of, of bread in the supermarket instead of 50, as I encountered in a supermarket this afternoon. There's only so much bread I can eat, and, you know, I can get on with my day. Shops are closed in Denmark from Saturday lunchtime and all day Sunday because you spend time with your family, as I used to in my old life. I don't need to buy so much stuff. So I'm starting to think that it's a deal worth making. Um, and, and throughout all the kind of research I was doing, I really started thinking a lot about uh, Abraham Maslow, so the US psychologist who um, is sadly no longer with us, but he, he had this hierarchy of needs, each of which need to be met before we can move on to the next one. Um, so they start with physiological needs, so things like breathing, food, water, shelter, clothing, sleep. Your basic needs pretty much covered in the developed world, looking at how Denmark is perhaps faring compared to other people. The second rung of Maslow's triangle is safety and security. So security of health, employment, property, family. And then it's love and belonging, so friendship, family, intimacy, going up to self-esteem, confidence, achievement, and up to the pinnacle, self-actualization. This, this thing that he describes as, as understanding your own creativity, um, acceptance, a real knowledge of who am I, what am I for? And, you know, throughout all of my research and my experiences and speaking to my experts and speaking to academics and sociologists, really coming back to this, this sort of, this is the science part, you know, this psychological diagram that shows, actually, it's very clear why Danes have a good life, because their physiological needs are met. Love and belonging, well, Danish kids go to school with the same people for 10 years, so they have a real sense of belonging. Family is prioritised in every area of Danish life. They're really getting to the fourth level, confidence, achievement, respect for others. And confidence and, and respect for others is something that are really, that's really fostered in the Danish school system and in most workplaces. So, in fact... Most Danes are getting a leg up right to the top of the triangle, and creativity is something that's been hugely valued in Denmark with these great designers, with, you know, with Lego, with, with all of these things. It's no wonder Denmark's pretty happy. This was my life maths. Fewer new shiny things equals fewer hours over time equals a happier life during the Danish winter so that you don't have to, um, and really putting together the, the top tips for living Danishly wherever you are. So I'd like to share those with you, if I may. Um, and the first of these is, you know, trusting more. It makes life, it makes life easier, um, it makes you happier, and trust becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's really worth giving it a go. The second is getting hugger. Um, you know, light a candle, brew some fresh coffee, be kind to yourself, spend time with friends and family, just the ones that you like. It has to be the ones that aren't emotionally overwhelming. Um, and just, just be gentle and enjoy yourself. It, it's not going to make everyone obese if they have one cake. The third is using your body. So, you know, run, dance, jump. Use your body any way you can, um, and you'll release endorphins. Number four, address the aesthetics. Uh, Danes do, so, you know, make your home as beautiful as you can. Less choice, you know, can, can free you up. It frees up your time, it frees up your headspace to, to do more things. So, um, if, if choice is feeling more like a burden than a benefit, do something about just, just choose to do slightly less. 
Number six, be proud. Um, it's very un-British, but I would urge you to find something that you or folk from your hometown are really good at and own it. Danes are also, um, they have the lowest uh, level of gelotophobia in the world. And does anyone know what this is? Any takers? This is the fear of ridicule, fear that you're going to be laughed at. And in Denmark, they have the lowest levels in the whole wide world. So they will happily break out into song. I mean, they just... There's, no, there's not shame. Being cool is overrated. Just be enthusiastic and have a nice time. Number seven, value family. Um, family is prioritized in every area of Danish life. And I'm not talking exclusively blood ties here. It's about making time and, and prioritizing the people who matter to you, the people who you're closest to. Um, so with all of the regular rituals built into Danish life, you've pretty much, you're guaranteed a party every month. You're guaranteed a national holiday every so often. Um, and because Danes leave work on time, they get to spend time with their family. And because shops are shut from midday on a Saturday, the weekend is really time for friends and family. If at least you can leave your work behind as you walk through the front door, then do that and spend time with your family, not your smartphone. And number nine, play. It should be no surprise in the land of Lego, playing is considered a worthwhile opportunity at any age. So, you know, Danes are pretty good at setting aside time to bake or draw or create something. It's something that's pleasure for its own sake. It can also contribute to new ideas. There's lots of studies that show that doing something manually, using your hands, can, can stimulate ideas, can stimulate um, you know, new trains of thought in areas you may not have thought of. So if you're stuck at a problem with work, do something. Just make, build, play as often as possible. The messier, the better. And number 10, share. And you'll be happier too. You can bake a cake, take it round to your neighbours, or invite someone in to share your hugger. To explain uh, the difference in happiness levels across all nations of the world. And, of course, what emerges uh, is that income is a factor, but it is one of the smaller factors in explaining the differences. Uh, and the factors which are really important are the quality of human relationships, uh, how much people help each other, how corrupt they are, things that Helen mentioned uh, how trustworthy they are and how trusting they are. Uh, and one of the things which has struck me, uh, having a little acquaintance with the uh, Scandinavian systems of education uh, compared with ours, and actually the Scand it's all the Scandinavian countries are pretty near the top, though Denmark is usually uh, uh, the highest. But the, the, there's an extraordinary difference in the philosophy, um, perhaps an increasing difference, in that... In the Scandinavian countries, there's a very strong emphasis on focusing on the things that uh, children have in common with each other and, the, the, and therefore the way in which you would naturally respect all the other children. Whereas I think in our country, there's increasing emphasis on how different children are and what distinguishes our child from uh, somebody else's child. And, and you can see that this focus on how uh, one child or person is doing comparing with another, if that's the way in which we feel uh, happy by doing better than other people, of course you can see that's an absolutely fatal uh, formula for social progress because it's impossible uh, for uh, people in general to feel they're doing better than people in general. <laughs> if somebody goes up, somebody else has to go down. So this is the sort of zero-sum uh, feature of, I think, a central element in our culture. And it's one, actually one of the reasons we set up Action for Happiness, to fight this zero-sum mentality that you, you are your main way you can justify yourself in life is by how you do compared to other people. We must absolutely get away from that. And what's so wonderful is that we have this living example of, of something different, uh, which we can refer to. We can uh, a, a look at the, the way they do their schools and try and uh, copy that more, focus more on the well-being of children and less on this rat race, uh, uh, exam factory uh, approach to education. A lot of employers here could learn about it. I mean, one of the most striking things, you know, when these happiness uh, researchers ask people how happy they've been at different points uh, of the day, uh, yesterday, uh, the time when people are least happy uh, is when they're with their boss. Huh. Uh, and this is a frightful reflection on the way we think we should be motivating our people 
Um, we've got to have uh, a, a, a system of motivation by internal reward rather than external reward. Um, 